all I can tell you is that the experts know nothing, including myself. And a major reason for that is that basically all we know is what we hear from government approved sources and the mass media, which are basically minions of the government. And even the things that I hear and read, and I subscribe to several international newspapers in Hong Kong and London, and of course here in the US and others, uh, you've got to take it all with a grain of salt because uh, in war, it's been said correctly that truth is the first casualty. So mm -hmm. don't believe anything. So on that note, let's start uh, with the latest developments here. I mentioned Saudi Arabia, and my main question to you is, is the U.S. dollar in danger here? Yes. Well, it, it's been an increasing danger for decades, but now it's gotten to a critical level. Look, from the most basic uh, point of view, the U.S. government itself is bankrupt, terminally bankrupt. It can't dig itself out of the hole. In fact, it's digging the hole deeper. The uh, official... 30, 31 trillion uh, dollar deficit is being added to at the rate of a trillion, trillion and a half a year. So everybody knows, uh, certainly sophisticated people know that the dollar is a hot potato. And uh, the main thing that's holding the dollar up is the fact that it's uh, major commodities, oil, which is the world's largest traded commodity, are priced in dollars. But uh, if, if the Saudis and other countries start accepting the yuan instead of the dollar, then, then what do people need dollars for? This 20 trillion, nobody knows for sure, but that's a, a good estimate, U.S. dollars outside the U.S. Right. And if people don't need them to buy commodities, well, they don't need them for anything. And they're going to start unloading them. So, yeah, this is a really dangerous situation. And it's, and, not, and it's not just the Saudis. It's the Nigerians who are major African oil exporters are doing the same thing with the Chinese. The Nigerians, the Saudis don't buy anything from the U.S., but they buy lots of stuff from the uh, Chinese. So it's perfectly logical. If the U.S. dollar's you know, role um, and dominance as reserve currency uh, is coming to an end, I mean, what, what replaces it? <clears throat> well, that is a $64 question. Uh, I think what's going to happen is that we're going to go back to gold. Look, even the Chinese and the Russians, who are closer now than ever, do most of their trading, I understand, with U.S. dollars, which is crazy. Uh, they have to clear those dollars through New York, the homeland of their enemy. You don't use the enemy's currency, for God's sake, or, or the adversary's currency, if you wish. Uh, it's best that they use a, a neutral currency, one that can't be inflated out of existence, one that can't be closed down at the discretion of some half-crazy pals in Washington, D.C. I mean, Russia's had all of its dollar accounts uh, uh, confiscated or, or put on ice, as it were. So any country realizes it could happen to them. So uh, the U.S. is shooting itself in the foot by trying to punish the Russians. And hold that thought I want to get back to. But first, let me dig a little deeper. But what you mean we return to gold, like a gold standard? Or how would that work? What would it look like? Well, ideally, it would look like something we had in the 19th century. You might recall that in the 19th century, uh, which was an excellent period of time in world history, there were fewer wars, there was more progress, currencies were sound, governments were tiny. Uh, the franc, the mark, the lira, the dollar, these were just names for specific amounts of gold. And uh, I, I think it'll go back to that. Uh, listen, you really don't want government involved in currencies. I mean, gold takes governments out of currencies. You don't have to trust a government if you use gold. So yes, as, as uh, strange as it sounds, I think the world is going to go back to gold. Because it's the only, I've said this so many times, but it's worth repeating. It's the only financial asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. And all the world's governments, especially that of the U.S., are bankrupt. So who wants their liability? Would there be enough gold to support such a system? Yes, it just depends on the price of gold. How much gold is there in the world? Well, it's uncertain, but say about 6 billion ounces. Uh, and if we do some multiplication, 
uh, divide the amount of ounces that the U.S. Treasury owns, for instance, which is supposed to be 265 million. If we divide that into the number of dollars outside the U.S., we come up with a very high price. Divide 265 million into 20 trillion. Uh, divided into the amount of the U.S. debt, if the debt was going to be paid back and with the U.S. gold reserves, a huge high number again. That's on the one hand, Daniel, but on the other hand, <clears throat> and I've been long gold since 1971 when I bought my first gold coin. Yeah. And it's done, you know, they always said uh, a quarter ounce of gold will buy you a, an excellent meal in the best restaurant in New York. A quarter ounce of gold will buy you an excellent suit. Uh, not that anybody wears suits anymore. Gold is reasonably priced right now. Let me put it that way. Relative to other commodities, relative to stuff in general. It's yeah. not cheap. It used to be cheap. It's not cheap anymore. But I think you can go a lot higher because there's going to be a panic into gold. Remember, only financial asset that's not somebody else's liability. There's not going to be a panic into lead or a panic into cadmium or copper. Well, there might be for other reasons, but not for money. Yeah, I think it's going higher. You should be buying gold for savings and for insurance and for prudence. At these prices, I don't consider it a great speculation. It was a great speculation back in the year 2000 when it was selling for $250 an ounce, when incidentally, it was cheaper then than it was in 1971 in constant dollars. But now it's just kind of reasonably priced. So continue buying gold, but buy it for savings. And you don't really want savings in a bank because mm -hmm. you know the dollars are being inflated out of existence. You may have you might wind up bailing in the bank yourself, like happened in Cyprus. So yeah, your your serious savings should actually be in gold coins. Doug, why, you know, would you not think that the next currency, instead of gold, wouldn't it be some sort of digital currency? Uh, there's no conflict between the two things. Um, gold can be represented in a digital way. In other words, gold held in deposit, and you trade hundredths of a gram of gold on your smartphone. So it, it can be very good. The, the important thing is that the currency that you use is backed by something. It's something real. Uh, and of course, this comes it comes to the question of, well, what about Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin real? And as a, as a money, it actually, Bitcoin suits most of the characteristics, or actually all of them are good. It's durable, it's divisible, it's convenient, it's consistent. And I always ask myself, well, what's the value proposition in Bitcoin? When I get holding the bag just with a digit on my smartphone if I own Bitcoin. And then it occurred to me that 75% of the people in the world, uh, if they save anything, they're going to be saving it with worthless currencies like dirhams and watches and, and pesos. Um, so the value proposition with Bitcoin is that you don't have to, you, you have a transfer mechanism where if you're in Zambia, you can get your money out of Zambia anywhere you want instantaneously. But if you have Zambian watches, you're mm -hmm. stuck, basically. So that's the value of Bitcoin. It's a transfer mechanism. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. If we were to return to some gold-backed uh, system, Doug, what would this? Uh, where would that put the price of gold? I know that's a pretty hard forecast mm -hmm. for you to make, but approximately, where would we be? Well, like I said, I've, I've computed this in the past. It's a question of whether the dollar still remains the numeraire. I don't know. You just can't tell because <clears throat> mm -hmm. if we have a reset of that type. Mm -hmm. There's probably, on the one hand, going to be defaults of a lot of debt, bonds, and so forth, government paper. So that would mean dollars are wiped out. But at the same time, governments are going to try to prevent that from happening, and they're going to be printing up more and more, as they're doing now. So uh, 
I hesitate to, uh, to guess. What I'll say is this, own gold in your own physical possession for savings. And if you want to speculate, uh, own gold stocks, because uh, industry-wide, the all-in sustaining cost, um, this is the highest cost parameter you can use, of gold stocks now is about $1,000 per ounce. Some are much less, some are much more. But 1000 is about what the world average is. But uh, gold is selling for close to 2000 So the margins in the industry are tremendous. Gold Companies that are actually mining gold are coining money right now, but the market mm-hmm. doesn't seem to care. In fact, the market doesn't even seem to know. Uh, they all think that gold is a pet rock. Maybe and, that's what it is. Maybe yeah. that's exactly what it is. The market doesn't know, not the pet rock, that the market doesn't right. know. Right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm very long gold stocks because in the market, which is generally quite overpriced because all the money printing that various governments have been doing now for decades has flowed into financial assets. And uh, people that manage these financial assets don't believe in gold for all kinds of reasons. So it's not even on their radar screen, gold stocks. So that's where I want to be. I think there's going to be a panic into gold stocks at some point. There's going to be a mania into gold stocks. Doug, let me ask you this, bringing it back to money here. Um, Does the war in Ukraine, there's a lot of talk of it fast tracking the Great Reset. Uh, Do you agree with that? Well, Yeah, the Great Reset. This is a term that was coined by the people that go to the World Economic Forum in Davos every year. And uh, these are the rich and the powerful. Uh, And they really, I think these people really think that they ought to uh, control the the little people out there. I mean, they treat this like a, uh, they treat the world like a, like a cattle farm, where uh, most of us our uh, feedlot cattle, a few of us are free range cattle, and they're kind of like the cowboys that are trying to keep us in order. To that point, uh, you've been on the show multiple times and in the past, you were speaking about the coming Fed dollar, uh, which maybe at the time seemed like it'd be, you know, a decade, maybe five years away. But all of a sudden, you know, we get uh, new executive uh, mandates, on cryptocurrency and we see that in it hidden perhaps in it in it is talk of a coming digital dollar and how the government is now seriously considering it and maybe they're already working on it um the 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 timing of all this is interesting well it it is it it would seem like the powers of darkness are making their move it's like the uh, the black riders from mordor of uh you know have ventured out and, and and decided to to make their move the uh, digital dollar, uh, it's going to be one of the biggest disasters that's ever been visited upon people. I mean, look, what did Klaus Schwab say? You'll own nothing and be happy. Well, you might recall that uh, Biden's candidate for comptroller of the currency was a, was a woman named Sala Amarova, uh, a Russian. And one of the things that she was putting forward was that every American would have an account directly with the Federal Reserve, and you would have digital dollars on your iPhone. It would obviate a great deal of the current banking system, which incidentally I'm not a fan of, but that's a different story. Now, at that point, uh, you're going to be very much like Will Smith in that movie, Enemy of the State, Mm -hmm. where everything that you have, which is digital today, your, everything from your credit cards to your bank accounts to the statements on your stock account, everything. Uh, you can be shut down by the government, or if the government chooses to, they can airdrop $1,000 or $10,000 into everybody's account. Uh, no, this is, a, this is like the polar opposite of using a gold standard, where you can control your wealth, and it's deep, this would be the total politicization of wealth, which is to say, the control of wealth by people that get control of the government. And at this point, uh, people with very bad philosophies control the apparatus of the state. And once they do that, you're in big trouble. Look, once Hitler took over in 1933 and controlled the apparatus of the state, it was game over. When when, uh, uh, Lenin took over Russia in uh, 1917, it was game over for the next 70 years. And uh, I, I just hope that 
we're, we're not that far advanced here in the U.S. But, uh, but when Mao took over China, he changed the nature of the country for, for a long time. Uh, we may be at that point in the U.S. I don't know. Could be. It's possible. The trend has been very negative for a long time. The one thing about crypto, I made over 3,000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, $1 million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. And you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where do you start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof. To the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.